Hello everyone, my name is Caetano Miranda, the Director for the Education and Diffusion of Knowledge of the Research Center for Greenhouse Gas Innovation, one of the leading uh, engineering uh, research centers of APESP. Today on our RCGI colloquial series, we have the most, one of the most promising uh, researchers at uh, RCGI, the Professor Thiago Lopes from the Poly Polytechnic School in the University of Sao Paulo. And uh, you are very grateful for the general support of the, our founder uh, sponsors, Papes and Shell. And here you have the support, the technical support by uh, Ana Paula Vasconcelos from our communication team. So following our brief introduction in the lecture, we are going to have a questions and answers session. And uh, we stimulate you to bring your questions, comments along with the uh, presentation with, within the chat. So it's a real pleasure to have Professor Thiago Lopes here. He has a PhD in science from the University of Sao Paulo with, some, with experience on the uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory and also in the Imperial College uh, of London. So back to Brazil, Dr. Lopes uh, holds uh, FAPESP Younger Research Investigation Award at uh, RCGI. And uh, uh, he has a very impressive portfolio of projects varying from hydrogel, the VINAS, uh, fuel cells, under the electrochemical uh, perspective. Today, he is going to tell us about this exciting promising projects with the talk is saving the world uh, one CO2 molecule at a time. So with that, Thiago, thank you very much for accepting the, the invitation. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Caetano. It's a great pleasure for me to, to be here and uh, within the second RCGI colloquium. And uh, I wish to contribute with the diffusion of knowledge within the, the, the results we're obtaining within our project and uh, within um, RCGI. And um, the, the talk today, I'd like to, to discuss with you, as Professor Caetano mentioned, saving the world one CO2 molecule at a time. We uh, wish we can uh, contribute to uh, the world on that direction. I'd like to first uh, thank our sponsors, uh, Shell Fapest, Fapest Shell, right? And uh, the support as well of uh, the Polytechnic School and the University of Sao Paulo on promoting uh, the development of young investigators as myself and as many others we have within the university and in Brazil, and uh, I deeply wish we can uh, contribute with the socio-economic development of Brazil within the projects we carry on uh, at RCGI. And uh, it's also a great pleasure to work at RCGI because uh, we can carry a transdisciplinary approach and uh, within a very motiva motivational environment. And uh, this is key to promote innovation. So let's uh, start with uh, uh, my presentation. So what we, we have today, um, as, a, as a world, we've progressed uh, through um, an impressive socioeconomic development. Um, we today have a high standard. And it was thanks to uh, mostly fossil fuels. And uh, we need energy, and it's good, because it has propelled us to live longer with a healthier life, healthier life, and we love it, right? We love the way we live today. It's uh, great. We can, uh, for instance, uh, today, within this uh, beautiful technology, we can communicate life across the world and uh, communicate signs, which speeds up development as well. However, we've been uh, progressing to a turning point where we need to cope with the CO2. Let, let, let's focus on CO2 today. On the CO2 we've emitted along the, our way towards this development. And today, uh, uh, we have point that along our history, we've been using mostly fossil fuels. 
However, it's important to note that every human activity generates or emits greenhouse gas, CO2, and many other gas, which are even uh, more uh, challenging than CO2 to our environment. And we need to consider ways to tackle this challenge, that is the amount of CO2 that we've put into our atmosphere through sinks and through abatement. And we're going to discuss a bit of this today. So, as I mentioned, every human activity produces uh, greenhouse gas or emits greenhouse gas from agriculture to industry. And we need to deal with this soon because, as uh, uh, Professor Paul Artashi mentioned in our first RCGR colloquium, it's a huge debit, and we're getting uh, to the point where we need to deal with that and turn this around so that we stop increasing the amount we've emitted and we turn down and reduce this amount. So as an exercise for us to understand at a higher level, imagine that we can capture the CO2 emitted on industries and add that to an airplane. And this airplane lands on an uh, airport, and this airport promotes the transformation of CO2 to other molecules. Today, I'll highlight two ways. This CO2 can come back to the atmosphere quickly, so that, for instance, we burn a fuel. It's quite important because we stop using fuels that grab CO2 from anywhere, right? And, emit, and put that into the atmosphere. And we do, so, however, it's a fast turnover. We remove the CO2 and it comes back to the atmosphere quickly. And it would be quite interesting if we could do a negative way so that we suck CO2 from the atmosphere and sort of disappear with that. How we could do that? We have both geological, storage, like salt caverns, that is actually uh, carried on RCGI, it's an interesting uh, way, and we also have R RCGI, chemical transformation. They do both, fast and negative. Today, I, we're going to discuss about the electrochemical reactors and how can they can promote negative carbon, uh, uh, can promote the storage of um, CO2. We are going as a society around the world through a transformation where more and more of our activities are going to be powered by electricity. From housing to industry, farming and driving or transportation as a whole, and electrochemical transformation is going to have an interesting there. Why? Because electrochemistry or electrochemical reactors, they do both. They can produce electricity from molecules and they can use electricity to transform molecules into other more useful molecules. And today we're going to discuss about electrochemical reactors that transform CO2 and water into other molecules. So one feature we're going to discuss today is about converting carbon dioxide to oxalic acid with electrochemical reactors and converting water contained into vinas into hydrogen and oxygen and more and importantly concentrated vinas. So today we're going to discuss about electrolyzers. Okay, we focus on this today. As a country, Brazil is uh, quite unique. We already have a quite uh, clean energy metrics. And within the sugarcane sector, we have some potentials that we can uh, um, develop towards contributing to our historical debit as CO2 emitters. Within the sugarcane meal, we are today 
we have pure CO2 from ethanol fermentation, and we have a surplus electricity. Great. So for an electrochemical reactor, we have both. We need CO2 and electrons. So let's feed this to an electrochemical reactor and convert this CO2 to oxalic acid. So let's go, go further. Why oxalic acid? Shell has a vision, quite an interesting one, to promote a virtual cycle for carbon capture and storage. Because if we consider carbon capture and storage as only storing CO2 into uh, geological formations, it's mandatory, first of all, all right? However, it's costly and doesn't produce an actual product. Obviously, it helps sustain our life, so it's mandatory. However, if we can uh, sort of um, alleviate the amount of CO2 that we need to store, it would be fantastic, especially if producing a uh, valuable molecule. And that's it, it's here. So getting CO2, transforming that into oxalic acid through an artificial process, that is through an electrochemical reactor. Getting a biomonomer, that's natural, natural photo photosynthesis. We can produce a hydrogel. And this hydrogel has many applications. And today I'll highlight its application within agriculture. Within agriculture, we get this hydrogel and add that to the soil. It has many benefits, ranging from a reduced amount of water needed for, for, for irrigation. Bear in mind that the greatest amount of water required by uh, fresh water used in our world goes to irrigation, to agriculture. Right? So I'll leave it this. We also help with um, releasing not only water in a controlled manner, but also fertilizers. So we also reduce the amount of fertilizers needed. And one, about one third of the carbon stored into this hydrogel remains into the soil. So imagine we're doing a virtual, promoting a virtual cycle to store carbon and consider that about 10% of all land in the world is used for agriculture, it's a large scale. So we can significantly contribute to carbon capture and storage and to the pain of our historic conditions and to survive as, as a society we sustain our planet. Here I, I've done, uh, uh, we've done some uh, uh, work on this. So imagine we have an electrochemical, in, electrochemical industry and this electrochemical reactor product, product, products and we use power to produce molecules. So we remove CO2 from uh, the air, as I mentioned, especially from industrial uh, uh, CO2 emissions, get electrons and convert that into molecule. So the amount of CO2 we get with an electrochemical reactor compared to the amount of, C of CO2 emitted by the electron used is much, very negative, and especially for oxalic acid, which means that the amount of CO2 that we store is much higher than the amount of CO2 we need to promote the transformation. And this is quite huge within oxalic acid. So we have the ox an oxalic acid that has, that has a carbon negative footprint. And we may have a hydrogel that's going to have carbon stored into the soil. So let's see what we get. Making some assumptions regarding the conversion of or the production of hydrogen and the carbon negative footprint of this final hydrogen, we can estimate within Brazil how it could contribute. So considering the, the area uh, utilized in Brazil for agriculture and as I mentioned within the assumptions, we could contribute to a huge abatement to Brazil 
That is, about 4% of our CO2 emissions today could be cut from our budget. If we consider the world and the land, the planted land for agriculture today, this could amount to about 1% of the global CO2 emissions that we could promote only by adding a hydrogel produced with an electrochemical reactor and a biomonomer to store carbon within a virtual cycle that is geared for as beneficial for everyone, for the one that's producing, for the one that's using, and to the planet. And if we consider that hydrogel has applications that far beyond um, the agro industry, we can uh, uh, um, think that the size of our contribution may be huge. And we are working to develop this electrochemical reactor. Another uh, uh, um, bit of research we've been conducting within RCGI is this, trying to help the sugarcane industry to cope with one challenge it has. Sorry, that is Venus. Venus today, or from, from the beginning, is, is quite of a challenge because it's a waste water. And the way that it was found to a deal with this huge volume of Venus produced, which is 10 liters of Venus per one liter of ethanol produced, it, it, the sector found ways to defer irrigation so that they used Venus to fertilize and irrigate the field. However, I know that the fertilization is the most important bit, right? Where the industry has been trying to concentrate Venus to reduce the costs and actually use what matters, that is the potassium within the Venus. It's quite important, right? Potassium, uh, phosphate, and nitrogen. So, one adding one, you know, looking into the big picture, bioenergy or the sugarcane sector has been central uh, to Brazil since its beginning. And uh, I remember Professor uh, watching a, a talk of Professor Brito, the, the former uh, scientific director of FAPESP, that ethanol eventually has been the greatest contrib scientific contribution of Brazil to the world. And we still have many space to increase the amount of ethanol we can produce, right? With a low land use chance, considering degraded areas. So what we're going to discuss on the next slides, you can imagine and think that it's going to, it can be expanded considerably. Well, as I mentioned, we have sinks and abatement. Sugarcane, as other plants, naturally does direct air capture. And they're quite efficient. And why all they do direct air capture? They already transform the CO2 into other molecules. And within the sugarcane sector, transforms into sugar and ethanol. So it would be fantastic if we could go beyond this product to impact many more or many other areas of our uh, society. And that's it. Sugar cane, uh, sugar cane goes to sugar, ethanol. It, however, it has byproducts. It has baguettes, biomass that is burned to produce electricity. And obviously, it emits CO2 to the atmosphere. Venus, as I mentioned, is used for fertilization. irrigation. However, with some uh, 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 drawbacks. One of them is the huge cost associated with its, with its transport, plus CO2 emissions. So could we go beyond this and say, can we go from sugarcane to anything? Yes or no? Let's discuss. So we have the sugarcane mule. It has a surplus electricity of about 50 kilowatts 
our Bertoma sugarcane that today is sold to the grid, right? So it has a surplus selling to the grid, and it uses Vinas for further irrigation. And Vinas has about 95% of water. If you consider our world as I mentioned already, we are within a challenge situation where fresh water is already under stress. We can help that with hydrogel, but it's, our, it's under stress and it's huge, right? And the world is talking about green hydrogen. So if we have fresh water under stress and we need to produce green hydrogen, how, how do we close uh, the, the loop? Obviously, we can have a salinization of seawater, but then we add a, 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 compound, a cost for that. So it's sort of adds one extra process, and add cost to the system, reduce the overall efficiency. So, what about what about getting the surplus electricity and Venus and use an electrolyzer to concentrate Venus and produce concentrated Venus plus hydrogen and oxygen. It is what we are working towards, developing an electrochemical reactor that is capable of doing this, concentrate Venus selectively and at the same time produce hydrogen and oxygen. And this opens up a new, uh, uh, um, it unlocks many other possibilities within the sugarcane sector. So that we have, we get sugarcane, right? We have the biomass that we burn with air today. Then we can uh, have the electricity. Then we get the vinas, this electricity, concentrate the vinas, produce concentrated vinas, and as byproduct, oxygen and hydrogen. And far as final, we're going to have fertilizer, that is the concentrated vinas. We can have nitrogen fertilizers because we can we have not hydrogen now, so we can produce a nitri nitrogen fertilizers on site within the, 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 the same industry. Hydrogen can be sold as a commodity as well to many applications. Plus, we have oxygen, right? Oxygen can be used to burn the biomass. So then we have the noun oxyfuel combustion. What's the, 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 the importance of oxyfuel combustion? Basically, you have a carbon containing biomass, you have pure oxygen, almost pure oxygen, right? You don't have nitrogen, then you burn it, you're gonna produce a pure stream of CO2 and water. And we don't produce NOx, huh? with a potent GHG emitter. So we can separate easily condensation, then I'm going to have a pure CO2 stream on top of what I already have of the, of the ethanol fermentation. So we end up with ethanol, sugar, biomethane. Let's remember it's ramping up presently. We have hydrogen and oxygen. With these molecules, we can ideally envision that we can produce anything. So we can use sugarcane to produce whatever we need today. Right? Obviously, in the future, unlocked up by development of this technology. And through a simple techno economic analysis, we can look into the savings it could contribute to the sugarcane sector. In terms of uh, uh, 1A, as we concentrate Venus, we reduce the amount of uh, 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 the volume or the way we need to transport. So we can reduce our uh, expenditure on this. Plus, we're going to have hydrogen. 
which is the most expensive beat of nitrogen fertilizers production. Obviously remembering that natural gas is converted to hydrogen, then it's used into the natural fertilizer synthesis. So considering both, we could contribute, or we could, this technology could cut about 3.5 billion reais to this sector, considering Brazil as a whole. And uh, the, 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 the harvest of 2019 and 2020, right? And this considering not you know, optimistic scenario, nor a worse scenario, pessimistic one, a medium scenario, right? And in terms of CO2, as we discussed, well, we have the fertilizer, so we cut the CO2 emitted during the, the synthesis of the, the natural fertilizer because we would have hydrogen that has eventually, well, this, these numbers consider a hydrogen that has a zero carbon footprint, but eventually it could have a negative carbon footprint because, as we discussed already on the last slide, oxygen can be used for the oxygen combustion of biomass. Then, if we consider these figures, savings in terms of CO2 of only the natural fertilizer, and the biomass burning or baggage burning, we're going to have an amount of about 118 megatons of CO2 year, pure CO2, that can, can be directed to geological storage, as I mentioned, salt covers, it's quite important in my humble opinion for Brazil, and to produce hydrogel to the world and to explore and to produce many more uh, other uh, 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 molecules, right? And this would represent about 25% cut on our CO2 emissions as a country. And if you go further, considering the potential of the technology, only considering Brazil, but the scale it would impact the world, it's about 1.3% of the world emissions that the sugarcane sector in Brazil could cut. So it would be a, 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 a sink, a carbon sink. And as I mentioned, considering the molecules we can produce, it can promote abatement as well. I wish that we've, uh, uh, along these slides, we've discussed about how we can, within Brazil and within the agro-industry in Brazil, that's a strong, well, eventually the strongest field, economic field in Brazil, how we can contribute not only to Brazil, but to the world to pay off our historical missions. Again, thanks for our sponsors, uh, FOPESP and Shell, Shell FOPESP, and uh, to the opportunity to work within RCGI, which promotes our, uh, uh, promotes innovation, promotes our development. Uh, I say as a young investigator, right? We have uh, the possibility to, to grow up quickly and see our ideas moving through the TRL scale quickly, which is quite motivating as well. Now I go back to Professor Caetano. It is very impressive. And also uh, the, the ideas of, in terms of innovation here that the talks with the, the agribusiness at the same time, you're looking for a very specific part in terms of uh, from the molecular level and you have uh, these planetary implications due to, to these technologies. So, uh, I mean, people were invited to, uh, to bring your, your questions, so let, but I have a few of them here. Let me then start with some. Uh, the first one is a curiosity is uh, how do you, how do you see uh, the impl uh, implementations of those technologies in terms of time. So you see that's something that is can be uh, in a short term, long term. How how yeah. is your yeah yeah your view on this? You know, my wish it's as soon as possible because uh, you know we are reaching a, a, a turning point where you cannot lose this, right? We need to to, to deal with the, our historical conditions as soon as possible. 
but down to uh, uh, like uh, realistic thinking pragmatically. I, I, I wish that we could, by the end of, of like, a, like late 2020s, right? Mm -hmm. I wish we, like 2030 at most, we could have this within industry already. So it reaching, you know, the TRL of an industry level and not deploying that. I really wish we, we can do it. And as I, as I mentioned, I, I truly believe because within RCGI, we, we tackle the challenge within a transdisciplinary approach and from the nano to the, you know, centimeter meter scale with great scientists. It's been a great, great pleasure as uh, I have a pleasure to work with you, Caetano, with um, oh, let's uh, not, side, not to forget anyone, but it's, it's no, my, 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 my view is this. Mm -hmm. In a, how do you see as a challenges for this implementation? I mean, uh, what are the gaps that you think that is the most challenge on both technology, the hydrogel and also for the uh, Vinas concentration, concentrator? Considering the hydrogel, uh, uh, one great, one grand challenge is the development of the electrochemical reactor. Mm -hmm. Another one is the conversion of uh, the, the oxalic acid plus a biomonomer into hydrogel and the regulation, right? Uh, so that we have a technology, but it, it needs to go into the market. The market should uh, accept that. Plus, we need to have regulate regulations so that it can actually enter the market and it's safe. Uh, it's validated that it's safe, so that consumers buy it. And all, uh, it was it went through the, all the process. And uh, the beauty is that a shell is already looking into that. So there is a project developed by the reactor, looking into the conversion and looking into the regulation, right? So uh, it's uh, tackled. Uh, so, so, so that. And um, we think the, 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 the chemical concentrator in us per se is the, the, the device, right? Mm -hmm. The actor. It's a challenging matrix which requires an, an innovation on that. And uh, we are trying to, to tackle that. We think, as I mentioned, on wood scale, looking into uh, uh, the electrodes, the fluid dynamics, mass transport. How to optimize the power optimization, molecular dynamics. We're looking into that through many different uh, uh, approaches, which speeds up the development as well. And uh, uh, I was, I mean, once that you have the device, or even for the, uh, in a general perspective for the electrochemical reactors, how is this to scale up? You know, because you will bring a very interesting numbers uh, I mean for the uh, the role that the agribusiness have here in Brazil and the, the perspectives if you can could use those devices uh, it's, it's something that they're very impressive but uh, how do you see the problem to scale up because it's not a, yeah the, the technologies is still yeah it's, a, it's an interesting question because we are used uh, to the model right, of a uh, chemical industry where is scaling up is getting bigger. A unit gets bigger, right? However, on electrochemical reactors, the unit doesn't get bigger. You get more units, you know, one by, uh, no, one, another one, another one. So you build up a stack of a single unit. Obviously, you can increase a bit the single unit, but you get a stack. So scaling up, in principle, it's not quite challenging for the chemical mm -hmm. uh, reactors because this would be in, in, in line with electrolyzers for water electrolysis, which goes on this way, right? You put one unit by another unit. So the challenge is left to the balance of plant components, which in fact, nowadays, it's well established. So, you know, in principle, scaling up wouldn't be uh, a concern, but I'm curious See, go through this, and so that we, we can get that. But as I mentioned, the principle and from other experiences already in the market is not a great challenge. Mm -hmm. In the have already uh, are in conversations with the agro business. How how they do how they see 
uh, this technology's uh, potential. Yeah, I know. So to be they're quite excited to the be chain. Uh -huh. Yeah, to be honest, they're quite quite excited. Uh, we have discussions with uh, uh, some already, for instance, Haizen, and uh, one um, ethanol producer in the south of Brazil, and uh, interviews. You know, I've had the opportunity to, to give another one. You know, these days, it's going to come up on the Jornal da Cana soon, right? Mm -hmm. The agro, the agro sector is quite interested in this because uh, um, coping with Vinas is a great challenge that they've been trying to deal with for a long time, and the regulations get tighter and tighter. So they need to, to deal with that and add with the case of hydrogel. If we solve a problem, creating new solutions, you no, know, many more commodities to the same industry. It a virtual cycle. So you solve a problem and create more money, right? And help the environment. Mm -hmm. You know, it, as a, another thing that I like to, to highlight as well is that uh, the bio end program of a the beautiful bio end program of Opas has already highlighted that cities or communities where sugarcane is nearby they have a higher standard of social economic development right and if we could contribute further to this by adding more technology which in principle would contribute to higher salaries within this sector with so uh, 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 huge impression and well distributed we could promote social economic development as well so you know this is one of my, my main drivers to be honest in the uh, now, maybe one question or more related with uh, strategical, political strategic here in Brazil, because uh, you mentioned the, the possibility to also to manage the production of, of hydrogen uh, at the same time to be integrated with the uh, the politics that you have already for the ethanol. Uh, how do you see in the terms of the hydrogen as a vector of energy in the it's something that uh, you should invest on it or you know you should convince uh, the people yes for instance uh, uh, um, i had a chat with uh, uh, guys that are at europe and europe see brazil as a great source of hydrogen you know they're not going to be able to produce all the hydrogen they need and they, they see brazil as a huge potential for that so what however what what i see is that the electrochemical concentrator of Vinas is going to produce hydrogen for industrial applications, mm -hmm. centralized hydrogen production. And I understand that ethanol is ready as a hydrogen carrier. So exporting ethanol would be straightforward instead of getting the hydrogen, the CO2, I will have lots of that, and producing something to carry hydrogen. Why not get this to produce some, something else? Because I already, have, I, have, I already have ethanol to carry hydrogen. It's ready. It's over there. As I mentioned, we, have, we, can, we can increase that considerably. The amount of ethanol that we can produce in Brazil with pretty much no land use change. The amount of area is huge. So let's scale up that. This is going to scale up the amount of hydrogen produced as well, the amount of oxygen, the amount of CO2. And let's use this to decarbonize other sectors like sustainable aviation fields, and many other sectors that are challenging to decarbonize. So, you know, let's spread, not compete. As I mentioned, my humble opinion, centralized, decentralized. Centralized the chemical concentrated gas, decentralized ethanol, and this is already there. We can increase considerably. Let's use that and use the, the hydrogen from the electrochemical concentrated of gas to many other applications we can contribute as well. In the, on top of that, uh, so you already sought uh, uh, other possibilities rather than the Vinas, for instance, that could, in a parallel, what you have for the sugar cane uh, to be used uh, in other. Well, we are sourcing them with, with, uh, uh, um, within our uh, recent collaboration that we are starting with Heisen. We're sort of discussing other things but we haven't got um we haven't been able to uh, i haven't been able to, to 
do some calculation there and you know, go and mm -hmm. that. We're writing a paper that eventually we're going to come up with that. And then, uh, uh, well, look for this paper that's going to come up. Hopefully, we get to the point where we do can use other uh, uh, sources. And uh, uh, just to finalize, Thiago, I think that one of the beauties of your portfolio of project is that talk with several programs within the RCGI, you know, you have it, the BEX, uh, the, even the greenhouse uh, emissions, as well, the nature-based solutions. So how do you see this integration between the, the projects? And uh, uh, particularly from my side, I was curious, uh, how, how also do you see this combination of uh, uh, both uh, uh, experimental you know, and uh, together or to scale up for the uh, at industrial level, as well the understanding of uh, fundamental uh, mechanisms and fundamental uh, uh, phenomena that you have within the uh, the system that you are studying. Yeah, it, it's uh, as I mentioned, it's quite interesting. Professor Judith does a great job on that in integrating the the, the different areas, and uh, and I experienced that as a quite beneficial. Uh, approach because uh, we look into the small scale, into the large scale, and uh, it's quite important for us to look into, for instance, you no, know, looking at least my, my experience is that looking into the final reactor, the practical reactor, we're going to have constraints, right? So this is going to direct what we do at the basic size. Mm -hmm. So we basically it's like that. Uh, 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 an example is that we're cut, you know, down, we're cutting trees, and we need to go up and look if we're going the right direction, or if, we, or if we're going to a deep hole, or if we're going up, right? And looking into the, the, the big picture, the final device is going to direct the, the development, the, the, the fastest development at the low level and you know, I mean, at the, at the scale, at the low, the, like the nanometer scale, and the nanometer scale feeds up the centimeter meter scale, because it, the, the, the large, at the large scale, we need to understand the inner workings so that we can model that. And in the middle, we have experimental validation because uh, we need to, to actually, you know, to properly model that at the micrometer scale and the micrometer scale. So integrating that fosters a quick development of a technology through the, the TRL scale. And on top of that, it's quite interesting because, uh, uh, for instance, having a device which is geared in terms of technology, performance, fantastic, but then we need the regulation and public acceptance. So human behavior or behavioral science is fundamental and the regulation so that it actually enters the market. So uh, uh, this framework we have at RCGI, uh, in my humble opinion, really truly speeds up the development and adoption of a technology. And uh, I don't I don't have a, a long career, but in my humble opinion, it uh, increased considerably the chance of uh, implementing a device. Mm -hmm. Well, Thiago, thank you so much for the talk and for the discussion. So with this, uh, thanks for watching us. And I uh, hope to see you guys soon in the next uh, RCGI colloquium. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay.